Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, please, from verse 12, we'll start to read. And he, he said, therefore, that is the Lord Jesus said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money. that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. And he said unto him, well, thy good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thy authority over 10 cities. And second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept let up in a napkin. For I feared thee because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou lest not down and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, out of thine own mouth I will judge thee, thy wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then, gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? Then he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Let us pray again. Father, we ask you now that you would speak to all of our hearts. We thank you for so many on a Sunday evening that you've brought in again to your house. And we thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness. Lord, will you bless them and give them the desire of their heart, Lord, according to thy will. And we ask you, Father, now that you would shut each and every one of us in with your own good self and that your spirit, he would move from seat to seat and heart to heart. Lord, that we would have an encounter with you, a challenge by your spirit. And, oh God, that we would have something for you in return something to hand back to God at the coming of the Lord. So, Father, strengthen your people. Now, Lord, take all things that are interrupting our minds, that have clouded our thoughts today. Lord, take them away from us and help us to put them aside that we would see Christ in all his beauty and in all his glory. We worship you. We love you. We tell you there's none like you. And so, Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus tells us a parable, and he's given it of himself. It's a man who goes into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return again. And so he's speaking of when he's crucified, when he dies, when he rises again the third day, ascends into heaven, he goes to be glorified. And, of course, we know he's at the right hand of God this evening. But he's coming again. His words are occupy till I come. But how do we occupy without power? How do we occupy without strength? And what is occupation? What does it mean for the Christian? What does it mean for you and I, even in Donna Cloney tonight? To occupy, he says, he gives us the parable of three men who are called. In fact, there's more men in the parable, but three he speaks of. And every man, there's 10 who receive a pound each. And at his coming, he comes to see what they have done with their pound. Something before we go any further, I want to let you see that I believe in this. There are servants and there are citizens. Citizenship doesn't save you. There are servants. Notice what it says here 
in verse 13. And he called his ten servants. In other words, they know him. They love him. They want to follow him. They want to be with him. He calls his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Then we have in verse 14, but, notice the word here, but his citizens, that is those who were in the kingdom, or that is those who were nationally there at that time, but his citizens hated him. Two different types of people. His citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now, Jesus is telling us here that he's going to go to Jerusalem for after this parable, look at verse 28 of our chapter. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. In other words, he says there are those who are citizens and there are those who are servants. There are those who are saved and there are those who are lost. And when he talks about this parable and the citizens, he's speaking here of the Jews who would say at that day when Christ brings a battered, bloody, and beaten Christ to them, behold the man. And they refuse him by saying, we will not have this man. It's not right to reign over us or away with him. Away with him, crucify him. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. This is what is going to happen to me. So there are citizens and there are servants, or there are those who are saved. There are those who are blood washed, those who love the Lord Jesus, those who have found forgiveness at repentance at the cross, and there are those who are citizens. Citizenship, no matter your citizenship, does not save. Citizenship does not save only coming to Christ in repentance and faith will save your soul. Now I notice here what he says. He says, occupy, verse 13 at the end, till I come. He's telling us he's coming back again. He's telling you and he's telling me he will return. And even tonight our title is occupy until Jesus comes. So he gives his servants a pound each. Notice there are 10 servants. Now there's a prophetic word in there too. I haven't time to go into it. In other words, there are other folk outside of Jewry who would receive the kingdom. And that is you and I tonight. And so he shows us that we, that is you and me, you and I are to occupy until Christ returns. Can I ask you a question before we go any further? Are you occupying with the gift, the talent, and the money which Christ has led in your charge? Now, I don't mean physical money. You know what I'm saying, according to the parable. Are you occupying, are you trading with what Christ has given you? When he comes again, and he says, I'm coming again. When he comes again, when you have something of a Christian testimony, of a Christian witness, And a Christian lifestyle, will you have a testimony to hand to him to say, Master, I'm your servant. I'm a saved believer. Listen, we are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace through faith. But we don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. And we reach many people in the lost because we love him. So when he returns, are you and I ready to stand before him as Christians? Notice this. What occupies your life? We're speaking to Christians mostly tonight now. Maybe you're not saved. What occupies your life? There are many things and people who can occupy your life and you're not saved. They occupy your life until Christ can no longer be seen in your life. What is occupying your life, Christian? Worry, fear, anxiety, stress, I'll be honest, sometimes in ministry, you're so busy in ministry, it occupies your life to the point where you have to. 
You have to, at some point, reel in, as it were, yourself and get into the place with God and seek his face. And it occupies you. What occupies your heart? What occupies your thoughts? What occupies your time that used to be spent in the presence of the Lord? What occupies the time when you used to be at all of your meetings? Now, we are, we are blessed here because we have always a great turnout to our meetings and you are so faithful. But what occupies us at other times? The word occupy here simply in Chambers Dictionary is explained like this. To take or to seize. To take possession of. So in other words, what occupies your heart and your life, your mind? What has taken you and took hold of you? What's seized upon you? That Christ no longer is first in your life. That Christ no longer is the first in your family. That Christ is no longer the first in your heart. That Christ is no longer the first in the morning. What occupies the man and the woman? Jesus says to the churches in, in, uh, in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And he mentions all the things that's occupied them. And it's good things to do with the service of the kingdom of God. Then he turns to them and he says, but I have somewhat against thee. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You have left your first love. Christ no longer became their first love. In fact, when he had said this, and when this was written by John, they were maybe second or third generation Christians. And, and the Christians who had came at the time of Pentecost and around that time filled with the Holy Ghost. Now their children have come and their children have come. And there's been a weakness and a link somewhere where they were no longer trained up that Jesus was the Savior. And Jesus was the healer. Jesus was the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And that Jesus was the soon coming King. And what happened was they started to have their minds and their hearts blurred from Christ being first. Oh yes, they believed and yes, they served. But sometimes well, we do the work of the Lord and we forget the Lord of the work. Jesus says, I had somewhat against you. You've left your first love. Brother, sister, can I ask you? Have you left your first love? Let me emphasize tonight, is Christ the first in your life? Well, no, pastor, because I believe that my wife should be the first in my life or my husband should be the first in your life. Wrong. I believe my child should be the first in my life. Wrong. Jesus should always be the first in your life. Always. He that loveth son or daughter more than me, he said this, is not worthy of me. In other words, Jesus demands. There's a strong word. And I know again, it's not this what teaching tonight. It isn't preached in many places, but this is the old teaching. And this is what he says. He that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He said that. So tonight we want to look at occupying until Jesus returns. Occupying to take possession. You and I should be taking possession of the things that are around us. I'm not saying going out to steal things. And I'm not saying to go out and take that which is not ours. In the spiritual realm, the devil wants to come into our homes and into our families and into our minds. He wants to attack our bodies with sickness. He wants to do all of these things. And guess what, church? We're allowing him to. We're ruling over and we're forgetting. A.B. Simpson, he was a, an old Presbyterian and he realized one time when he's a wee boy and they were staunch Presbyterians. They didn't believe in the healing power of Christ. Oh, well, maybe if we pray, God might do something. But A.B. Simpson wrote that wonderful hymn because he had received a great healing from God. And he went on to serve the Lord and to tell of the healing power of Christ. And he wrote that yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. He wrote, still he loves to save the sinful, heal the sick, the lame. Cheer the mourner, still the tempest. Glory to his name. What a Christ we serve. And the problem with the Christian church is we have thrown out the four square gospel. 
Many Pentecostals have thrown out the four-square gospel, and we're trying to replace the Holy Spirit with program. We're trying to replace the things of God with ritual and ceremony. And what it is, it's whitewash on a dirty wall rather than tearing it down and building better for Christ. Here we have, the Lord says, to occupy until he comes again. Mark 16 and verse 15, the Lord Jesus says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Everyone must hear of this wonderful Christ. I told you a few weeks ago, when I was it last week? I can't remember now. Or a couple of weeks ago when I preached on preach the gospel. The gospel is more than a saving matter. The gospel is about salvation. Jesus is the savior of the soul. Amen, brothers and sisters. He is still tonight in 2016, the savior of the soul, which means if he is still the savior of the soul, we have none other to preach. We have none other to preach but Christ. And we cannot reach them by being like them in the world. But rather we show them the glory of Christ in a life that has changed. And we lift and exalt his name. Notice this. The gospel is also that Jesus is still the healer of the body. Jesus is still the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. He still baptizes in the Holy Ghost. There's one other, the gospel is the prophetic word that he is the soon coming king. This wonderful Christ that we serve, he says to you and I, he says in this parable, he says there's 10 men. Now this is talking of the generally the northern kingdom. And listen what he says. He says, But there are 10 men which represents you and I tonight. Those of us that Christ has went out into glory to receive a kingdom is coming again. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he says that he's coming again to receive that work which you and I have accomplished. Not for salvation, but because we're saved. He says that he will exact of us that which is due his name. I notice this. He says, I want you to go forth and I want you to take hold of, to lay hold on. I want you to seize, to take possession that everywhere your foot treads, to claim it in the name of the Lord. See the slum next door to us. When we were just a wee group here, I felt the Lord saying, buy that land. And I asked how much this land was next door. This wee bit next door, 580,000. Absolutely ridiculous. It was the height of the, the money, the housing boom. Couldn't afford that. And I met another pastor, and there was another man I didn't know who was a pastor. He was from, a foreigner, he's from another country. I don't even know where he was from. And I was telling him that we'd love to get this land beside us, but we don't know what's going to happen, but I think feel the Lord's going to give us it. But it's 580000 for that measly piece out there for the price. And we went over, and we walked through a lot of rubble and stuff, and we stood in the middle, the three of us, and I remember it was in the afternoon we held hands, and we claimed it in the name of the Lord. We now own it. Bought and paid for it. Better still, the Lord took half a million off it. (laughs) It's to claim and say, Lord, if you have told us that we believe you for everything you say, so we will occupy till you come. What does God say to you about the sickness in your body? What does God say to you about the things that have troubled you and the, the mountains you have to climb and the valleys you have to walk? What does he say about the storm that has come before you or the giant that faces you? What has he said to you? Has he told you that he's with you and neither leave you nor forsake you? That's lovely. But what if he tells you? What if he tells you he wants you to go forward in his name and fight? 
to lay hold on and take possession. We sang, we went to the enemy camp and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. And many Christians don't really believe that. They say, yes, the devil was defeated. But then if the devil's defeated, it's time for you to be victorious. If you're in Christ, how was the devil defeated? He was defeated at Calvary. You are an overcomer in Christ. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 tells us, listen, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. In other words, here they have the blood. Here they're walking with a testimony. They're not wishy-washy. They're not here and there. They're not one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. They're walking in a testimony with him. And then they start to occupy until he comes. They're already an overcomer through the blood. Their testimony speaks to the world that Christ is real and alive and glorious. And they loved not their lives unto the death. In other words, they were sold out for Jesus. Sold out for him. And the church today is sold out rather for the things of the world, for the loves and the pleasures that this world can give us. Would you believe me if I told you I've only got the first two lines of my message? (laughs) Notice this. While going into all the world and preach the gospel is what we should be doing. It is occupation in a sense. Occupation is more than preaching. For you may not be a preacher. Do you know every Sunday morning when you break bread, you're a preacher? Do you know that? You're preaching by your actions to the world. When you go to to either our church or wherever church is listening, you're preaching to your neighbors. You're preaching to your work colleagues. You're preaching to those who see that you're at church on a Sunday morning to go and break bread and remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ by the taking of the emblems of the bread and the, the wine or the juice. We take juice. But we are, we are saying to the world, I'm preaching by my actions, by my lifestyle. And what I'm saying to, to Donna Cloney or wherever else we may be, we're saying, I believe that Christ is risen from the dead. I'm going to remember that he took my sin, but now he's alive and he sees me at the breaking of bread. And there he'll meet with us in the spirit. Amen. And the world is saying, what is wrong with these people? that they're willing and wanting to be up on a Sunday morning. Why not pull over the duvet? Well, many do that, don't they? Friend, every time you come to break bread, you're preaching. But preaching is not all it is either. Occupation is a lifestyle. Occupation is a lifestyle of faith and of service and of sacrifice of self. Occupation is a lifestyle of confidence, not arrogance now. Confidence in the Lord. That when you're praying, you're believing. Confidence in the Lord that you are his, his own elect. That you are his and you are washed in the blood and you're fully cleansed. And as you stand before God and men, you're righteous in God's sight. You're clothed in his righteousness. You're justified. You're declared just before almighty God. That's, this is occupying and taking this what we have, this pound from the parable and saying, Lord, I must trade with it. I must trade with it. And you know, when a man and a woman fully have come to a real knowledge of Christ, when a man and a woman have fallen in love with him, when a man and a woman have been in close communion and fellowship in contact with him, like a husband is with a wife in their union, can't help but speak of him. Can't help but trade for him. You see, the third man says, I knew you were an austere man. You're a bit hard on it, Lord. And you don't know the Lord. (laughs) That's what he's saying. Well, if you knew that, at least the, the fear of it should have made you do something. But that wasn't him at all. So when the Lord gives these pounds out, he says, occupy. Occupation has boldness. Occupation has obedience. And occupation is overcoming the devil and ruling in victory with Christ. You and I as believers, sometimes we tend to live in, as, 
as it were, under Christian privileges. What do I mean? Well, you and I have the covenants of God. The promises of God are, are in you because they're all in Christ and you're in him. We don't realize the riches of God in Christ or else we would go spending. If you knew the riches of God in Christ, you would go spending. Oh, not for our own will and our, our own wants and our own gains. It's not to satisfy our own needs, but we would take from the riches of Christ and go spending on a world that is lost and without him. Spending. Trading. And when Christ returns, he will have and exact much from us. Notice this. You and I, in our standing with God, we are not to harm or hurt, but rather we are to be a blessing to all peoples, all nations and races. When God called Israel, they were to be not a master race, but a servant people. And you and I are to be not better than anybody else, not a master race, but a servant people, serving others. The Lord Jesus said, you and I are to be wise, as wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Now, when we think about this, Jesus is saying this. He says, serpents, you're to be as wise as the world. He didn't say like the world now. He didn't say you're to be like the world to win them. He didn't say that. And Christian, the more you become like the world, the less you're going to win. But rather we bring the world to where we are. He says that we are to be as wise as serpents. We are to be as wise as the ungodly. We're to be as wise as these Jews in the parable, as it were. He says, be you wise. Listen, stupid, no, or stupid. Christian, don't be stupid. I wasn't calling you stupid there. <laughs> I was looking down and seeing a couple going, he called me stupid. <laughs> he was looking at me. Listen, Christian, don't be stupid, in other words. You're not someone who, we have no sense and we're just to bow down. Listen, you don't spell Christian uh, across the, the top of our forehead, M-U-G. You'd be wise in this world, but harmless to them again, uh, harmless as doves. The, the wise speaks of the man and the woman of the flesh. Understand where the unsaved come from. Understand with where the Christ rejecter is. And, and listen, be as wise as them, but be harmless like a dove of the Spirit. Be have the Spirit of God, the working of the Spirit, the love of the Spirit, the giftings of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit in the life. Be like Christ, in other words. The Spirit of Christ is within you, and let that Spirit live from you. Wise as a serpent, be wise out there, but be as harmless as a dove. The problem is, many Christians tend to cower in the corner with their faith rolled up in a ball, and I'm just waiting till Jesus returns. (laughs) Oh, hurry up, Lord, and come soon. You know what you're doing? You're like the man, the third man here, who takes his pound and wraps it up in a napkin and buries it. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Jesus comes, oh, this is a horrible world. He says, listen, take your pound and trade with it. He says, take your pound, he says, and go out there. Oh, I can't, I can't. And you're not overcoming in the faith. You're not realizing the riches of God in Christ, which are yours because you're in Christ. Listen to what Timoth- or Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and 7. You all know this verse off by heart. He says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Listen, he has not. See, if you're in fear tonight, then that's not of God. Do you hear that? It means the spirit of timidity. You're so timid as fear comes on you. God doesn't give you the spirit of power or fear. But what does he give us? A spirit of love, power and of love and of a sound mind. Do you see the word here for sound? It's a big long word, so I'll try and pronounce it for you. So from Esos, that's not the way it sounds, I think, but it means God has given you a sound mind, a disciple's mind. Hey, listen, think about this. 
Christian, God has given you the mind of a disciple. His servants, he gave every one of them a pound. He says, you're a disciple. You know, a disciple is someone who is disciplined in the faith. You're disciplined in the faith. God may show you things. God may lay things on you. The Holy Ghost may point out the things you have to hand over. He may say to you, listen, what you're doing, this is not of me. You're trying to, you're trying to take the, the things of God and cover it up because of, of things. You're not really sensing my power. You're not really knowing my anointing. You don't realize what, that my power is for you, that I'm with you, I'm not against you, but, in, but instead you want to bring program in. God, help us and forgive us. One old preacher once said, not too long ago, he says that if the Holy Ghost was being removed from the church, he says that about 95% of the work of the church would carry on. Because they wouldn't know the Holy Ghost was the way. That his anointing wasn't there. You know why? Because we rely on things. A.B. Simpson, whom I mentioned earlier, you know what he said in his book? One of his books on healing, A.B. Simpson says, and listen, I know we have many from the medical profession in here and we, uh, in our our assembly, and listen, I, we appreciate the medical uh, profession. I I appreciate them. But A.B. Simpson says, in his day, a hundred years or so ago, he says, and then he says that we have relied too much, he says, on the things of the medical profession. So faith in our healing is no longer adhered to anymore. In other words, we put our faith in a hospital and we put our faith in what a doctor says and we put our faith in being nursed in a a bedside. He says, instead of getting before God and crying unto him until the Holy Ghost falls. And that's what's wrong with the church. Oh God, send your Holy Ghost again. We rely on so many other things as a church. I'm talking about in the church universal and, and we rely on other things and they occupy us rather than having the occupation of the Spirit of God. Would you tonight maybe in your heart not asking you to do anything but would you maybe tonight say in your own heart Lord occupy my spirit Occupy my heart. Occupy my life. Occupy my home, my family. Occupy our church. Occupy everything that I am and have. Oh, Jesus, come that I may put you first in all things. You know, whatever we're occupied in is that is that which draws us and leads us. That which we're occupied with is that which will use us too. And if you're occupied with the things of the world, then that is where you will be drawn to and that's what will lead you. But if you're occupied with the Holy Ghost, and if you're occupied off the Holy Ghost, he'll bring you to Calvary. He'll bring you to the blood. He'll bring you to Jesus. Every time, whether we're preaching or teaching or talking or working or laboring, wherever we are, we're trading he, the Holy Spirit, will come and he will occupy everything you do. I wish the heaven's occupational force would come down and occupy every one of our hearts. Here the term for, of a sound mind is discipline, self-control. We are to occupy until he comes. And if you and I ask him, to occupy your will, your mind. If you and I say, Lord, occupy my attitude. Occupy my life with your kingdom. You know what that is? When we get to that place, when we mean that, and the Spirit starts to occupy us rather than the things of the world, you know what that's called? It's called revival. That's revival. Because a man and a woman occupied A man and a woman with what they're occupied is what they will be drawn to and what will lead their life. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to occupy us to bring revival. Listen, Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Listen to what the apostle says in Romans 8 and verse 17. He says, Do and I, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so, be that we suffer with him, 
that we may be also glorified together. Now, notice this. If you take Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, listen, Galatians 3 and 29, it says, And if ye be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise of Romans 8 and 17. What is the promise of Romans 8 and 17? It is simply this. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, here's the promise that we may also be glorified together. So the glorification at the coming of Christ are those who are saved and blood washed, blood bought, spirit filled, serving saints. And when that comes, that is the promise of God. The resurrection and the glorification of Christ. The idea here for the word heir, an heir of God, it comes from a word, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this one, for it's even worse. To, it's hard to pronounce. And this is what it means it means the idea of using bits of wood for a purpose. So I thought about that and I thought, what on earth? How could that mean heir of God? And this is what it means. Let me put it in a more modern term, or well, an old term, but more modern for us. They used to get bits of wood and they used to draw allotments with them. And whoever got the short straw, that's the idea of it. In other words, there were pieces of wood of different length. And when one was pulled out, that was your allotment for a certain job. And that was maybe you got a longer one. That was your allotment. They had it marked out for allotments. And what Paul is saying here is, you're not getting a short straw in Christ. That's not what he means. He means there are different allotments and different lengths, if I can call it, pieces of wood. He says, and whatever one the Holy Ghost has for you in the election of God from before the foundation of the world, he pulls it in. He says, here is your allotment. You are an heir of God because you've been called out and here is your proof. That's what this means. And so we also read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3. Notice this. Here is part of your promise. Here is your allotment, your heir of God. Listen. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Who's read that before? And if you've read it and you've recognized it, very few. Do you know that you and I in a glorified state who have traded with what we have at the coming of Christ, we will receive reward or uh, gain or loss at the bema seat of Christ? Do you realize that when he comes back, that you and your glorified bodies, you're going to judge the world. In fact, you're going to judge angels. Who's heard that before? More have heard that one. This is the promise of God. Listen, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? how much more things that pertain to this life. Know what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, you don't go to court. Don't bring your brother to court. And brothers and sisters, that's something you must understand. No matter what it costs you, don't bring a brother or sister to court. Leave them with God. Judge the issue and leave it with God. Now, this is the context he's saying. He says, you're going to be judging angels. You're going to be judging the world. You're going to be the overcomers who have come under the blood of the Lamb, who have followed him. He says, and when this happens, he says, you're, can you not judge matters now in this earth? And you're going to be judging greater matters in the kingdom? Here's another thing for you. The matters that you're judging every day, can you not judge them by the Spirit and the Word? It might hurt you. It might devastate you. It might annoy you. But the Spirit and the Word says, listen, you might feel with a brother or sister at some point that something has happened and you went, well, I can bring them to court. Listen, that's fine. That, that may be so. But not before God. It's not right. Judge in this world that he'll sort this out. He will bring it to pass. Leave these issues with him. Listen, maybe something that's annoyed you or upset you 
and you want your pound of flesh and you're wanting to judge it, you know, judging it isn't going in with a baseball bat and beating somebody over the head with it. Who's ever felt like that? Be honest. There's a few liars in here as well. Look. <laughs> I have a baseball bat beside of my bed. That's just a waking Allison up in the morning. <laughs> but see, this isn't what, what the Lord's saying here. We judge in our lives. We need to look into the spiritual realm and the things that are behind these things and judge according to the word of God and the spirit and let God lead our lives and take control and do the judging for us. And he says, look, judge it now in the spirit. Judge it according to the word. Judge it by the things of God. He says, and when you do, he says, you're growing and you're learning. What for? That you're being changed to get ready for the coming of the Lord, for the promise that is of the glorification of the saints at the coming of Christ and the truth trading of the monetary as it were or the giftings and the talents and the things that you've produced of kingdom fruit for God he says and when it is he's going to give you a great reward and you're going to judge angels imagine someone like you and I I wonder if you get one of them big robes or whatever be a big glowing white robe we were singing when I get to heaven I'm going to walk all around have everlasting life Sit by my saviour and put on my crown. Sounds good. We probably will. But I'll be honest. I think we should just give them all to Jesus. Just give them to him. We would have no crown without Christ. Brothers and sisters, since this destiny awaits you, are you unfit today to decide smaller matters in your life? Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you, but I want, I want you to take courage in it. There's challenging issues in your life. Look, there's challenging issues in my life. There's challenging issues in our church at this time. You know that. But listen, we can do it. We can do what God wants us to do. We can live according to the word. Listen to what... Puritan Thomas Watson said. Listen to what he says. See the privilege of believers. They have both a spiritual and a civil right to what they possess. They who say our father can say our bread. Wicked men that have a legal right to what they possess, but not a covenant right. They'll have it by providence, but not by promise. With God's leave, not with God's love. So listen, when you see the world getting on, they might have it by what's known as, uh, uh, by the, the Dutch reformers, general grace. Grace falls on all men. God is gracious. God is gracious when he sends the rain and grows the crop. God is gracious in, on all men. It's saving grace that has come to us. It, it is irresistible grace of God that has drawn us. But God is gracious to all men. And so by God's providence, he allows them to prosper or to bless in whatever way he sees fit. Don't you worry about these things if you're feeling underprivileged. It's time you say then, Lord, I know there's a greater promise for me. I have, they, have a, uh, they have your providence, so do I. But I also have your promise. I also have your promise. They do it with your leave. In other words, because you just give them it. But I have it with your love. I'm going to close in a moment. Thank you for your attention. When we pray in, from Matthew 6, 9 to 13, we do the, what's known as the, it's not really the Lord's Prayer, it's the model prayer, really. Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We can say our Father, and many can say it, and many can sing it, and many can think it, but they don't know him as our Father. I'll tell you, I speak for me and you can speak for you. I know him as my father. He's my father. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I have something to ask you. Is there ever a time 
when the Lord's name isn't hallowed. We think about this. You see, we think because of people who blaspheme and say things, well, it's not hallowed and so on. And you're right. But God's name as to who he is, the name of Jesus is always hallowed because of who he is. So when we're saying hallowed be thy name, you know what we're really praying there? Thy kingdom come. Lord, let your power come down. Let your kingdom come. Let your Holy Ghost fill here for this unhallowed place. Hallow your name in their mouth. Hallow your name in their home. Hallow your name in their heart. Hallow your name in our nation, O oh God. Come down, O oh God. O oh, rend the heavens and come down, Father. Hallow your name amongst us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if God's will comes down in hallowed power, if God's name comes down in hallowed power, and if God's will comes down to be done on the earth, then what is in heaven must be on earth. Is that not right? So what is in heaven? The power of God. What is on earth? The power of God. What is in heaven? There's no sickness in heaven. When the fullness of the kingdom comes, there'll be no sickness on the earth either. In Luke 12 and 32, Jesus says, take this word home tonight. Take this word home, brother. Take it home, sister. He says, fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you, to give you, to give you the kingdom. Oh, this world, and we know our Christian heritage is being trampled in every corner. We know all the enemies, wicked wiles are trying to tear down the things of Christ and the word of God, and trying to destroy everything, even churches and the things they're allowing into it and gay marriage. And listen, it's not going to be long for a minister who's being forced to do that. It's up to the minister whether they do or not, but this man will never be doing it. I want you to know that. Well, he's shouting hallelujah there, is he? Amen. <laughs> listen, I'm closing. He says, fear not, little flock. Sometimes we think that we're diminished. We're not diminishing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. In other words, even death in the realms and regions of death will not prevent me building my church and bringing people to the kingdom. He says, occupy till I come. He wants you to take hold of that which you're afraid of and trample on it in Jesus' name. He wants you to take that which you think is impossible and believe him for better. He wants you to take that which is off the flesh and the things that are around us that destroy us or annoy us or hurt us and harm us, the things that make us want to recoil back in terror. And he says, I want you to occupy with what I have given you. Listen, are you a Christian tonight? Are you saved tonight? Are you filled with the Spirit tonight? Are you washed in the blood tonight? He says, then I've given you more than a pound to deal with, to trade with. He says, I want you to go out and say, I'm victorious in the name of Jesus. I'm victorious through the blood of the Lamb. For I overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. And I will lay my life down for Christ, for I will not love it even unto the death. Come on, Christian, that's what Christ... We are not a defeated people. You're not a defeated church. We're victorious. You just don't realize it. You're victorious. You just don't know it. You're victory all the way. Jesus. Read the back of the book. We've already won in Jesus. Already won in Christ. But we have to do the working out of it. You and I have to do the working out of it. May God bless his word. I have so much more there, but that'll do tonight. He says to the man, I must say this to finish. He says to the third man, I'm doing a paraphrasing for time. The third man does not trade. The first one, 10 pounds make 10, and he's ruled over 10 cities. The second one, five makes five, and he's ruled over five cities. The third one comes with his hidden pound, says, aren't I good? Look what I've got waiting for you. Now listen, he was a servant. Now I believe with all my heart this man was saved, but he lost reward. He says, take it from him. And give it to the one with ten. You know the old saying, if you want something done, ask a busy man. 
He says, take it off him and give it to one. But Lord, he's got 10. He says, yeah, but he knows how to use it. He knows how to use it. And I'll be honest, maybe you'll think this is wrong of me, but before when I've seen men with gifts and talents and they haven't used it, you know what I've said? Lord, can't get them to use it. Will you give it to me? I'll use it. I'll use it. Give their pound to me and I'll use it for your glory, Lord. If they're not going to use it, then give it to me and I'll bring back usury with it. And you know, when we stand before the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, that's not the great white throne judgment, it's a beamer seat. And then after this, you read on into this afterwards. Listen, I'll just read it quickly before we close. Listen to what it says, Luke 19. He says in verse 26, For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Verse 27, But those mine enemies, say I should not, that would not I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me, now, folks, see in prophetic terms, we can do it right into today. See in prophetic terms, at the beginning of this, he's speaking about the Jews re- rejecting him. And then after this verse, he goes to Jerusalem. He says, and this is what's going to happen. He says, there's going to be a day I'm going to bring them before me and I'll slay them. Now, do you see the Jews aren't saved today before Christ returns? There's not going to be none of this old stuff that, oh, everybody's good. There's going to be Jews saved after us. Now, listen, salvation is in Christ alone and none other. And why are they there? For Armageddon. God says, I'll create Armageddon. Bring them before me and I'll slay all of them. That's every unbeliever. Every unsaved. Every Christ rejecter. I hope you're saved tonight for he's coming soon. He says, when I come again, occupy till Jesus comes. God bless his word to all of our hearts tonight, brothers and sisters. And